so great to be with you uh, for This Is Church. And so, so we're doing this series because, uh, well, we need to talk about this thing called church, you know, because it can be a very polarizing thing. Yeah, polarizing. How is that for the 2020 word, you know, of the ages, right? But what I mean by this is that I bet that, you know, some people, when they hear the word church, that, you know, f- for them, Man, it's just such a comforting word. You know, uh, they're thinking, wow, that's the place that changed me. That's the place that accepted me. That's the place that gave me a family. That's the place that gave me a purpose. But for others, it's, it's a word that bubbles up s- some pain. Uh, maybe what's in their rear view uh, uh, is some painful things like judgment and rejection. Or, or maybe even it's a story of abuse. I mean, and so, so you know, when you hear the ch- word church... I mean, do you think of things like hospitals and education and literature and, uh, and the music and the arts and, and all the things that were actually birthed by the church? Or do you think of things like the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the televangelist money scandals? I mean, which is it? Which is it? Uh, so, so, you see, whether or not you're a, like a God, Bible, or Jesus uh, person is that you're going to need to answer what this thing is. Is the answer to it, the answer to the question, what is church and why you should even care and, and, and why that you would want to enjoy, uh, to, to join or, or to, identify, to identify or to invest or not. So, so what we're seeking to do in this series is to go back to the history of the early Jesus movement, also known as the church, to see what it is and how it might intersect with our lives. And, and, and the history is captured by a man named Luke. He was a Greek doctor, and, uh, and he wrote an account of the history of the early church. We have it in our New Testament. It's known as the book of Acts, or Acts as the Apostles. Now, now Luke also wrote an account of Jesus' life, a gospel, it was what we call it, um, and it, it was an account that bears Luke's name. And, and since this community starts uh, with Jesus, it was his idea, after all, I thought that we begin with something that Jesus did and he said that really establishes the DNA of this movement. And so let's take a look at what Luke records. It will serve for us as kind of a prologue. Luke chapter 5, let's take a look, starting at verse 1. It says, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, by the way, that would be the more common name for it, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. Now, as they were doing that, there seems to be a little bit of a problem here because the crowd was so large that it created uh, some uh, 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 problems with people being able to see Jesus and being able to hear him. Now, he saw at the water's edge two boats, Jesus did, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And, and he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. And, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, I want you to imagine, you know, you're Simon, you know, you're from that fishing village in Capernaum, and you're listening to this, you know, carpenter slash rabbi from landlocked Nazareth speak and teach, and, and as you're Peter and you're tending to those anchor lines, perhaps you're a bit drowsy from fishing the night before. Take a look at verse 4, it says, when he had finished speaking, when Jesus finished speaking, is that he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now it's here that things get a little uncomfortable because it's clear that this carpenter knows nothing about fishing, much less a rabbi. You see, every fisherman knows that come evening, the fish rise from the depths to feed at the surface, but during the day, during the day, they show no interest. This is not the way things are done on the lake of Gennesaret, far from it. So what Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, now you can maybe identify with uh, with just where Simon, or sometimes he's referred to as Simon Peter, and later he's going to be called Peter, uh, might be at. He's a bit wiped out from the night before, and the night before, he got skunked. Okay, that's fishing term for he didn't catch any fish, right? So you can imagine he's a little bit down as he greeted the dawn of this new day with little more than a sore back and nets that needed cleaning. And now, flushed with embarrassment, he 
begins to let down the nets as Jesus commanded, just hoping upon hope is that his fishing buddies wouldn't see him do it. But when they had done so, they, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, now imagine Peter and, and his crew, they're just frantically trying to manage the cap. Oh man, oh man, oh man, man, paddle over here. Okay, go ahead and steer over this way. Pay out more rope, we need some more rope. Oh, oh, that boat's going down, it's going down. Water's going in, water's going in. Whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody bail, somebody bail. But as he barks out those orders, uh, he has this feeling that knifes through him that, that, that he is with no ordinary man. It makes him feel f- afraid and even ashamed and not worthy to even be in the same boat with this Jesus. You see, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and says, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And with everybody wondering, what in the world just happened? And now what happens? Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. (laughs) You will fish for people. Literally, what he was saying is that you will catch people. You'll catch them. You'll save them. You'll rescue them, Simon. And, And after the greatest fishing haul of this professional fisherman's life, I guess you'd say is that he decides to go out on top. (laughs) You you see, after the biggest catch of his business career, they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, how could Simon Peter ever forget that day and what Jesus said? He said, said, Peter, is that you're going to catch men. You're going to save men. You're going to rescue men and women, people. (laughs) No, it would be completely, for him, unforgettable. So an opening day of the Jesus movement in Acts chapter 2 is that when Peter hears God's truth and speaks and then the the dust settles and 3,000 people say yes to Jesus and join the movement, how could Simon Peter not recall that day on the lake with the nets full in the words of Jesus, Simon, catch people. I mean, how could he not have just drummed up into his mind this idea of, oh my goodness, so this is what Jesus meant by that. And then days later, days later, something simple as God caring about, not thousands of people, just one person. Just one. Just one. Not the masses, not the multitudes, just one person. Uh, Somebody who was a nobody, as a matter of fact, someone that no one really ever paid much mind to. He was a lame beggar uh, that was there at the temple, and you met him last week if you were um, here joining in, and you found that we gave him a name. We called him Frank. You know, Frank, the the lame guy that that couldn't walk, and, and, uh, and, and Peter, Peter caught him. Caught him along with John, his fishing buddy. You can imagine saying, hey, this is just like catching fish. Take a look at this guy. And And so Peter and his friends just kind of keep catching people. So the DNA begins to woven into this movement. It tells us that this is not a movement whose focus was on to debate theology or to have potlucks or to discuss the rules, you know, things that you could do and things that you you, you couldn't do. Instead, 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 it was just to catch people. Catch people. They're instructed by the angel of the Lord in Acts chapter 5, verse 20, to go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Yeah, catch people. Which meant day after day, Acts 5.42 tells us in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Which moved them to more. More people joining the movement. Even a large number of priests at that time were joining the movement. And and more leaders appointed to help and to guide them. They were called deacons, actually. They they set apart a bunch of those guys to serve in that way. And oh yeah, more conflict, which came to a head with a leader named Stephen who was executed by stoning. And when that happened, uh, it seemed as though the, the floodgates opened to a great opposition because, you see, Stephen became the first of many people who were killed for being a Christian. 
He was killed not for something that he did, but for something that he believed. And on that day, Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says, on that day, on the day, on the day that Stephen was stoned to death, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Scattered. The movement is scattered. I mean, what's going to happen now? Scattered. That doesn't sound like a positive thing. That doesn't sound like a plus. That doesn't sound like a win. No one likes to be scattered. And, and yet, there was amongst the scattered uh, a man that we're going to focus in on today. Uh, he was a man called Philip. And, and he wasn't a fisherman, but, but you, you can imagine that he had spent probably significant time with some of these fishermen in Jesus' tribe, people like Peter and James and John, these fishermen. And, and, and you can imagine Philip, you know, hanging around a campfire, you know, with these fishing guys, you know, them telling their fishing stories, right? Because that's what fishermen do, you know? They tell them stories. And you can imagine them, you know, recounting the story, say, Philip, so it worked like this. Like, the nets were full and we were sinking. And then Jesus said, catch men. And now here we are. This is what we do. And so Philip, Philip is that he drifts 50 miles north up to Samaria, scattered up there, and then he goes to a place in a person that he never would have expected. Let's join into Philip's story in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord came to Philip. Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay, Gaza, you've heard of Gaza, haven't you? You've probably heard the term Gaza Strip. It's this contested uh, piece of land in the Middle East. But back then, back then, is that Gaza was the last outpost between Israel and Egypt. Okay, and Gaza was like no, nowheresville. You know, it was this, this desolate place, about as desolate a place as that you could ever imagine. And so, verse 27 says, so he started out, and on his way, uh, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now I bet when Philip saw the scene there out on that desert road that a smile probably would have uh, broke on his lips and a twinkle in his eyes and, and a prayer would have shot towards heaven that might have gone something like this. Oh Lord, you just set this up, didn't you? Because imagine Philip thinking, well, so here's this guy and he is no ordinary guy. He's far from ordinary. In fact, obviously he's important. Uh, he's wealthy enough to own a scroll. Those things were expensive back then. And he's educated enough to read the scroll aloud. Now that practice was also rare because hardly anyone knew how to read at that time. And he's reading probably in Greek. It's probably a scroll that, uh, that was a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language. It was called the Septuagint. Uh, and, and this guy, Greek is probably not this man's first language, but Philip, Philip knows Greek. <laughs> and of course, this guy's not from around here. He's probably from 800 kilometers south of here, way past Egypt into Africa. And he's black. He, he's a Cushite. That's what they, they called them. He's, uh, Philip must have been thinking, this guy's so different than me. And yet, and yet he must be a spiritually open person. Because here he is, headed home from a spiritual pilgrimage uh, from Jerusalem, and, and, and he has the scriptures in his hand. He has the word of God in his hands. So, so see, Philip knew then, that before he had ever even arrived on the scene, is that God had been at work in this guy's life big time for a long, long time. <laughs> Man, this should be really interesting. So, so, so now Philip, as we see here in the story, as we pause for a moment, is he is going to represent a movement of people who are engaging God in an extraordinary way. And so here's the question that we've been asking in our series so far. It's a simple question. What is church? What is church? And the answer is a church is a missional community that seeks to see God at work and to join him there. Uh, what this speaks of is the church is a family on mission. 
is that we've got something important to do. We've got eyes wide open. We're recognized is that God has been tilling the soil of people's hearts and that we get to join God in this harvest. And we get to partner with him. And it's exciting because, because, well, because he's the one in charge. Let me show you what I mean. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 29, it says, The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So I heard I want us to stop here for a moment because what we've already established is that God has been at work. Now that's been really easy to see, at work in this guy's life, but, but now what does it look like to join him in his work? So, so let's pick up on the pattern that uh, Philip provide, provide, provides for us. See, we, we see first off is that Philip uh, joining in his work, we see him doing this by being in step with the Spirit. Being in step with the Spirit, verse 29. When the Spirit said go, <laughs> Philip went. And, and, and you see, that's the Holy Spirit's job. His job is to guide us and to enable us to do God's will. And, and so really, it's all about, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's about adjusting our lives to Him. And, and, you know, we follow the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't follow us, by the way. Okay, He's the one taking the lead. And, and you know, Jesus, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come. And, and He would be a gift to every follower of His and and, and so we can know him and seek him to show us the next steps that we need to take. And now, there's a second thing that we see from Philip's life. Is secondly, is that we see Philip joining God in his work by, by asking good questions. Asking good questions. You know, Philip comes up to the chariot, not with a canned presentation, right? He just asks a simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? Simple enough. He just simply observes and he asks, ask a good question. And we can ask good questions. We can do the same. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a real uh, passion and a desire to try to, to move conversations that I have with people just from the you know, news, weather and sports, kind of blah, blah, blah thing, to something deeper, to, to spiritual conversations, to matters of the heart, things that really count in people's lives. So, so here are some questions that I thought I'd just uh, uh, share with you, or some questions that I, I'm trying to use in conversations that I'm having with people. Here's the first question. First question is, what's your spiritual story? Asking somebody what's your spiritual story. Say you meet someone for the first time and you're getting to know one another and you're finding out, okay, so like what's your family background? What's your educational background? What's your vocational background? And then uh, you can go ahead and ask, well, that's interesting. So what's your spiritual story? Huh? I've never had anybody ask me that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your spiritual story? What's, what's your God story? Everybody's got a God story, you know? And, uh, and then just listen to how that person's gonna respond uh, to your question. Now, here's the second one. It actually goes a little bit further, uh, kind of connected to the first one. And that is, so what does it mean to be a fill-in-the-blank indeed? Okay, you're saying, well, what do I fill in this blank with? Well, here's how this works. <clears throat> when you find out in their spiritual story that they identify themselves as something, maybe they say, well, my spiritual story is, you know what, is that I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. Or my spiritual story is that I was raised in a, uh, uh, a a Muslim background, or a Hindu background, or a Buddhist background, or uh, sometimes they'll say, well, I'm not really a religious person, I'm a spiritual person. And uh, so you're, you're hearing the way that they're identifying them, and so you can be saying, oh, well, that's very interesting. So what does it mean to be a spiritual person indeed? Like, you know, a real one. Or what does it mean to be, to be a bona fide Muslim? You know, like, you know, the one that's like 100%. Or what does it mean to be truly, truly, truly an atheist? Like, you know, all in as an atheist. And you ask the question, and then you listen. And then you listen, and to see how God guides that conversation. Now here's a third question, going a little bit further, further in. And this question, I love asking this question. Would it be okay for me to pray for you? Would it be okay for me to, to pray for you? It's a, it's a fun question, because uh, I think that it's a question uh, that, uh, that really helps in, uh, 
and just connecting with a person and their need because it might be through the conversation is that there's something that's going on in their lives um, that you uh, feel led to pray for. And so you just ask them, hey, you know what? Would it be okay for me to pray for you, to pray about that? Um, you might even take it a step further. It's like, hey, so can we pray for that right now? You might feel comfortable doing that. You might feel uncomfortable doing that, but you're gonna go ahead and do it anyway. Okay, some questions that we might be able to ask in the same way that Philip just asked a simple question that opens the door, that opens the door to this Ethiopian eunuch's life. Well, let's take a look at just a third one, a next one, and that is that we see Philip joining God in his work by using scripture to point to Jesus. Using scripture to point to Jesus. See, so for Philip, he must have been just been cracking up because, I mean, what could be a better Old Testament passage than the passage that the guy's reading right now? That passage came from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And it was written hundreds of years before Jesus was on the cross. And it gave uncanny details of Jesus' sacrifice and suffering and what it would look like. And, and so it's this perfect way to roll into to actually what has been happening in Israel over the last three and a half years that Philip has seen that he gets to share. And, and so, so here's the challenge. Here's our challenge is to learn more about the scriptures. And so good for you is that you're here today either in person at Terra Nova or, you've, uh, uh, or you're here online. And what we're doing today is we're learning about the scriptures. We're learning more and more about the scriptures. And that's always a good thing, right? And it's always a good thing to learn about the scriptures, not so that we can know a bunch of scriptures so that we can beat people over the head with them. Has anyone done that to you? Maybe so, right? Wasn't a, wasn't a good experience. Wasn't, uh, wasn't a, a fun experience. We don't learn the Bible to just beat people with a Bible. We don't do that. Instead, is that we learn the scriptures to bring good news. Verse 35 says that Philip then got a chance to share with the Ethiopian eunuch the good news about Jesus. You know, the word of God, it's good news, uh, the word of God is good news because the word of God can bring such healing to people. And perhaps, perhaps you know what? This man needed some healing. I mean, he's a, he's a eunuch after all, uh, uh, that, which means likely that he was castrated. And, and, and they had done those types of things in those days because they, they felt like these you know, high-ranking government officials you know, could kind of be more focused on their tasks if they weren't distracted you know, by, by the ladies or other things. And that, uh, you know, that's apparently why it is that they did that. It's a fairly common practice. It, but, but as a uh, emasculated man, is that he would not have been permitted in the Jewish temple. He, he, they wouldn't, you know, I mean, he, he, and, and that's where he's returning from. I and, mean, you know, we don't know what happened when he was there, but he, he's on this pilgrimage, obviously seeking God. He rolls up to Jerusalem, he goes to the temple, and before he sets foot in the temple of ground, people go, ah, 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 ah. see, we, we've heard about you, you, you you're, you're not allowed uh, to come in. How would that have made him feel? Disappointed? alienated, you know, feeling like, like he didn't belong. And, and so it would have been really easy then for Philip to say, so while we're working on this scroll, here, hand me the, hand me the scroll. Let's roll forward here. Just a couple of chapters. Let, let me just roll forward here. Isaiah 53, let's, or, or from 53 to 56, let's take a look at verse 3, where it says, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord, say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. I, I, I can't bear, bear fruit. I, I'm barren. For, for this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who will keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and holds fast to my covenant, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. It's coming. To them, to them, I will give within my temple and its wall a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. How about that, my Ethiopian friend? How about that? I mean, how, how about the word of God? How about the scriptures here? The scriptures that tell you that you belong. The scriptures that tell you that you can belong because of what Jesus has done. These are great words, aren't they? These are great words, words that heal, words of grace, words that are good news. Now, as we finish out the story, I mean, up to now, there's just so many remarkable and fun ways that we see God at work, right? Um, setting things up, and, and now here's a last one in verse 36. We're getting back then to Acts 8. It says, as they travel along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. 
Yeah, in the middle of the desert where there's never any water. Like, who knew? Like, who would ever see that coming? <laughs> he says, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Yep, you can just picture the scene. A Jewish man and a black man. Those type of men, both discriminated against many times throughout history. There they are next to each other. And Philip baptized him. Which leads us to the last thing in Philip's story that is a pattern for us. As we seek to uh, see God at work and to join him there is that Philip is joining God in his work by, number four, this last one, by affirming next steps. By affirming next steps. Is that the story is all about a next step and, and recognize that. And you know what? Everybody's got a next step. Everybody's got a, got a next step in their spiritual journey. I mean, we should all be open to next steps, shouldn't we? I mean, asking for next steps, you know? For, for uh, some of us that are unconvinced about all this is that our next step is, is, to, uh, is to explore more. Uh, for some of us that, unfortunately, is that what we've got is actually a whole bunch of head knowledge and not really a whole lot of action in our lives, so it means that we should serve more. That's our next step. Uh, for some of us uh, who uh, have followed Jesus is that we know baptism is a powerful next step. And, and it seems as though the eunuch knew that too. Uh, he, he knew enough about it. He knew enough that, uh, that it was a water ritual that would symbolize a person that was making a new start. It would symbolize a person that was really stepping into a new kind of life, a new kind of living. That's what baptism is. And so he wanted to be baptized. And so as he did, it says in verse 39, when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, which was like the next town over from Gaza, and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until uh, he reached Caesarea, up the coast, up the coast, all the way up to, to Caesarea. And that's what, uh, that's how the story uh, concludes. And, uh, and as it concludes with that, uh, we just have to kind of pull back here for a moment and just recognize that this is an extraordinary day. This is an extraordinary day. I mean, this is an extraordinary encounter, you know, that lasted probably the span of just an afternoon where Philip was on mission. He was seeing God at work and he was joining him there. He steps into the moment and he catches one. He catches one. But maybe you're thinking, Lyle, you know what? Not every day works like that. I mean, maybe you're thinking, you know what? Hey, Lyle, you know what? Some days is that I'm just not seeing God at work. Well, you know, what I do see are piles of problems and piles of laundry and piles of work. And, and what I don't see, what I don't see are open doors and open people and, and miraculous things. You know what? I get that. Because understand is that we have no reason to believe that every day was like this for Philip. Uh, in, in fact, Luke, he seems to be writing uh, his whole account as like the greatest hits uh, of God's workings and, and how the movement of Jesus expands from the Jewish world to include the rest of the world. And so, and so let's talk for a few moments as we wrap things up about what it is that we do when things are ordinary. <laughs> because things are ordinary most of the time, ordinarily, right? So just two things, two things. What do we do when things are ordinary? Well, here's the first thing is we wait. We wait. We wait, which is tough, right? It's tough because we don't like wait. We like fast, right? We like fast cars. We eat fast food. We really like fast Wi-Fi. And so we want things to happen fast, right? And, you know, waiting, waiting is not something that, uh, that in our culture that we are doing extraordinarily well. But you know what? We just wait. We just wait for it. We wait for it. We wait for God to work. And, and while you wait, while you wait is that you can ask God to give you eyes to see his working. So we wait and we watch. And then secondly, we train. We train. Now, here's something really important about uh, this journey with Jesus, about this Christian life thing, is that the Christian life thing and kind of how you grow in it is not trying harder, okay? Now, maybe, you know, you thought that it was. Man, I just need to get up, and I just need to suck up, and I just need to try harder and do better. It, actually, it's not about trying harder. It's about training more. It's about training more. It's about training. It's about getting ready. Is it, is it while you're waiting for that moment, waiting to step into that, you know, that God moment, you know, that God's been working on, waiting to step into that? Is that what we can do while we're waiting is that we can train. 
And, and it makes sense, right? It's kind of like, you know, I think it's the Karate Kid principle. You remember that movie? It was a while back uh, with the Karate Kid. You know, remember Mr. Miyagi and Daniel? You know, he was the, uh, the apprentice. Uh, and, and Mr. Miyagi was telling Daniel, wax on, wax off, right? You know, go wax the car. He was telling Daniel, go paint the wall, right? You know, he was asking Daniel to engage in some really mundane things. Well, all the while is that Daniel wants to be a karate master, you know? But, <laughs> but Mr. Miyagi knows is that he needed to train. Um, he needed to train. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not a really big karate guy. Uh, that's not my thing, but uh, some of you know that uh, my wife, Dana, and I, so we like backpacking, so we kind of do this backpacking thing, uh, and it's been great. Every summer, we go up uh, into the mountains, and we go backpack trips, and we do these trips, and we take some Terra Nova people with us, and we brought back everyone alive, <laughs> but we've had a close call or two, just uh, saying, uh, but, you know, as uh, I was thinking about this the other day is that, you know, we love uh, to, to be uh, up, in the, up in the wilderness doing our backpacking thing, but really in the course of the year, we are only up in the mountains maybe seven or eight days. That's it, you know, I mean, that's, that's all we do in a season. But we are taking about 10 times the amount of days hiking the local trails, grinding up hills on our bikes, you know, trying to stay in condition, going to the gym. I mean, you know, we're doing these things, we're doing these things, we're doing these things. Why are we doing these things? So that when we finally get to the trailhead and we strap on our packs and we're ready to go is that we can and fully embrace and be prepared for the experience. We train. You know, we, we train. We, we get ready. We get ready. Now, now when it comes to, to that God moment that you know, God is preparing, we want to train so that we'll be all that we need to be to step in to that moment. So, so here's what it looks like for me. Is it, uh, you know, when, uh, for that moment when I see, you know, God starting to work, you know, clearly at work, and, and when I see that opportunity is that I'm just going, oh, you know what, I want to be ready for that. I want to be ready for that. You know, I want to be ready uh, uh, relationally. And so, so I want to do very, my very best to have, to have solid, good relationships with the people around my family, my friends, you know, because I don't want to have a lot of relational baggage uh, that I'm having to carry around because when God, you know, does his thing, I want to step into that moment and I want to be ready for it. It is that I, I try to, to, to be ready physically. Talk to, talk to you about a little bit about that with the backpacking thing. But, you know, we're going to the gym and, you know, we're doing our thing. And, and you know, tr- so trying to exercise, you know, trying to rest well, trying to eat right. Like, that's a really tough one for me, you know, because I like, you know, food. And usually, you know, the general rule is that, you know, food that's not good for you is generally the most tasty, you know. So I'm having problems with that. But I'm working on it, you know, because I'm recognizing this, that God may call me into a moment where I'm going to need to be at, my, at the top of my game physically, I also want to be in a good place financially. You know, I, I want to make sure that I've got some financial resources. I want to make sure that I stay out of debt. The reason why is because that moment, that divine moment that God is preparing, is that it may require uh, some, uh, some, some resources, some funds for God's work. And I want to make sure that those funds are available. And then I want to be a good place mentally. You know, I want to be sharp, you know, mentally. I want to be feeding uh, my mind on good stuff, always in a learning posture. And finally, I want to be on the top of my game spiritually. It's best as I can be, you know, which for me, it just means, you know, being connected deeply to God, connected to his word, you know, connected uh, to the body of Christ in prayer, living clean with God, living clean with other people, you know, I mean, just doing those things, and I train that way, and I do all of those things so that if God calls, if he opens a door, if he says, it's go time, (laughs) my answer can always be yes. Yes. You know, over 2,000 years ago, the, the Jesus movement began with men and women who said yes. Who, who stepped into moments that were divinely prepared by God. And, you know, these people, hey, they were caught. And in turn, they caught others. And, and for next time in our series, you would never see coming who gets caught next. You will not want to miss next time with part four of This is Church. But for now, let's go ahead and wrap things up as, uh, as I pray for us all. Let's pray together. Lord, my prayer is simply that you'd give us eyes to see the way that you are leading and the way that you are loving and the way that you are working. And then, Lord, Would you give us the courage to join you in your work? And as we do, we know that things will change and that we'll be changed as well. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are a family on mission. So help us to accomplish your mission through our lives this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Lyle. Hey, in just a minute, we're going to uh, wrap up here, and I've just got a couple reminders, whether you're here in person or online, all of this applies to you, but in slightly different ways. So uh, that Connect card, if you filled that out, and I hope you did sometime during our gathering today, if you're, if you're watching online, you do that through the app. If you're here in person, it's that card that you got when that was on your seat. There are baskets right outside these doors. Uh, same with giving. You can give on the app or online. Uh, you can do that, by the way, if you're here in person. But there are also baskets outside. As you step out, you can uh, drop uh, those gifts there. You can also mail it in during the week. And then lastly, those serving cards. If you're signing up to serve over the next season, and I hope you are, uh, you can do that on the app or online, or if you're here and you'd rather use that card that was on the seat, you can do that also in the baskets. You, you'll get there. Don't worry. Uh, hey, so glad you were here together tonight or watching online. Thank you so much for being part of the Terranova community. Uh, it is my great desire and great hope that over this season that we continue to gather together, no matter how we're doing it, we need each other more than ever, and we certainly need God and his spirit. And so uh, please, let's keep gathering together. Have a great weekend, a great week, and we'll see you next week for part four of This is Church.